We all live in a digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust and to be trusted. We all despise control and desire freedom. We, we are all, all united. united. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Dynamic Coalition on the Sustainability of Journalism and News Media session here at IGF 2020, 2021. Uh, we're pleased to have you join us, whether you are in Poland or joining us here online. My name is Daniel O'Malley. I am the Senior Digital Governance Specialist at the Center for International Media Assistance. I'm joining you here from Washington, DC, and I'm one of the co-chairs of this dynamic coalition, along with my colleague, Courtney Ratch. And we'll, we have the pleasure of moderating this session together today. Uh, first, I just wanna tell you a little bit about the dynamic coalition uh, for journalism and news media. It was formed about two years ago, and it's a multi-stakeholder group uh, that convenes to discuss how we can make sure that the digital transformation leads also to a healthy and financially viable news system. I think as we've all experienced over the past year, we understand that the, uh, the business model for news has changed. This has been uh, a catalyst for this has been the change to our digital ecosystem. And if we want to fix this challenge, it's going to require all types of stakeholders, civil society, government, the private sector to work together to envision what our digital news ecosystem looks like and how we can make sure that it's financially supported. Um, I think that the, the global pandemic has just reiterated our, our, the belief that we all have and the power of information to help people, but also uh, that our digital systems are not necessarily prepared for the type of news ecosystem that we ideally wanna have. And so those are the topics that, that we discuss in, in this dynamic coalition, both during the IGF, as well as during our intersessional work. Um, and I'll be pleased to share with you more information about how you can join if you haven't already. Um, I'd like to give a brief overview of today's session, which will run for about an hour and a half. Uh, first, we're going to short, start with a short presentation by Guillermo Canella from UNESCO. He's gonna be talking about a recent report by uh, Free Press Unlimited on media viability. Uh, then Courtney will be moderating a panel on trust and the digital news ecosystem and what needs to be done by stakeholders there to make sure the quality news information, news and information surfaces online. Um, and then we'll have uh, you know, a brief uh, Q&A um, and we're really hoping that the session will be interactive. Uh, I'll be monitoring the chat here on Zoom. Courtney, of course, will be is on location in Poland and she'll make sure to incorporate the participation of those who are with her there. Um, but we really wanna hear from everyone in this audience so make sure that as you're listening, you're also thinking about any questions or comments that you may have. And I would now like to pass the baton to my esteemed uh, co-chair, Courtney Ratch. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, we are really delighted to have everyone here. And before we hand it over to Jeremy to talk about this report, I wanna do a little bit of scene setting so that we understand how we're coming into this conversation about news media sustainability and journalism sustainability in the internet digitally mediated environment that we're in today. We have talked a lot about uh, disinformation, about the challenges that algorithmic intermediation uh, has for journalism, which depends on visibility in order to be seen and, and to have impact uh, in its role as part of the public infrastructure of democratic accountability. Uh, we've also heard a lot over the past year and, and much longer, but certainly um, over the past year of the pandemic, of protest movements around the world, of overthrows of democratic governments and the um, takeover and coups um, by various organizations around the world and the role that social media has played in this. And we know that journalism plays a fundamental role in holding people accountable, whether those people are in government, in uh, bus the business sector, or other powerful economic and social actors. So the fact that internet governance and how we govern this digital sphere has such an impact on journalism is a central concern 
we believe for internet governance. But we are not here to talk about the problems today. We actually want to think about some of the solutions because we've heard about how YouTube's algorithm exacerbates extremism. We've heard about Amazon's recommendation system fueling recommendations around books that that string together conspiracy theories. We've heard about Facebook's algorithm, you know, delving people into extremism, linking across conspiracy theories, drowning out real legitimate news about the super spreaders of misinformation. So how do we combat that? We think that we have some ideas and the people who are joining us here on the panel today are at the forefront of implementing those ideas because it's around scaling content moderation, scaling news integrity and trust and building it into the infrastructure of our internet ecosystem. So we're going to talk about news integrity and trust initiatives and how we can really embed self-regulatory approaches that are driven by the journalism and news industry. What we can learn from initiatives like the Forum on Democ Information and Democracy, the Journalism Trust Initiative, NewsGuard, Ads for News, all of these other um, initiatives that are there to create indicators and signals of trustworthiness and integrity. How can this idea of trust trust.txt, which we're going to hear about in a little bit, be reimagined to create the technical infrastructure for promoting quality news information while not excluding marginalized voices. Um, can we think about how to scale these beyond just the context of Western, more highly developed media ecosystems to fill even those small under-resourced media ecosystems, and particularly in the global south where market imperatives might not be there for companies like Google and Facebook to fund you know, news initiatives or journalism support uh, initiatives. So we're going to hear from our panelists, Claire Wardle, who is the US Director of First Draft News and has been heavily involved in many of these initiatives. We're gonna hear from Jason Lambert, who is the Senior Director of Media Business at Internews and the Program Lead for Ads for News. And I have to say that it was a conversation I had with him that got me super excited about you know, bringing this conversation uh, to this venue and working with our dynamic coalition to really delve into this. We're also gonna hear from Olaf Steenfed, who is the Head of Journalism Trust Initiative and Media Ownership Monitor at Reporters Without Borders, uh, which is also leading the Forum on Information and Democracy. But before we get to our panel, I'd like to introduce Guillerme Canella de Souza Godoy, who is the Chief Freedom of Expression and Safety of the Journalist Section at UNESCO. And you recently worked with Free Press Unlimited, based in the Netherlands, on a report that had some pretty interesting findings about what media are facing in the digital ecosystem. And we want to hone in on what some of the key findings that you guys found um, that are relevant to this discussion today. Please. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you, Daniel. Always fantastic to be with you, too. Um, and uh, before I go into that, let me just say how impressive is this week, right? Uh, we had the first meeting with CIMA and Global, Global Forum for Media Development two days ago, also trying to go further on those issues. And then yesterday on the margins of the US Democracy Summit, there was another meeting co-led by US and the Netherlands, also trying to focus on those issues. Today and tomorrow, not only here in IGF, but also in the Democracy Summit, there is this discussion. As all of you know, today is the International Day to Fight Corruption, and obviously media viability and sustainability is fundamental for that. As you said earlier today, in IGF, Courtney, tomorrow is the International Human Rights Day, and, and uh, Ras and Murotov will receive the Nobel Peace Prize. So I think we also should take advantage of this momentum. I mean, we have a momentum where uh, we can actually make the case that uh, media viability, independent media, is central to uh, our key questions as humanity, not only media in itself or media independence in itself, but actually, as you said earlier, democracy, human rights and other things. So this is my first general comment to say that this is very appropriate. The second thing is that the work uh, that we are doing as UNESCO and that this uh, joint work with FPU is part of 
is, is, is an element of a broader strategy that obviously UNESCO started many years ago, for instance, under the IPDC with the, so, the, the very well-known media viability indicators, et cetera. But during this year, World Press Freedom Day, as many of you remember, UNESCO insisted as a main topic that information is a public good. Uh, and uh, we, in the Vinduk Plus 30 declaration that just two weeks ago was endorsed by all the 193 member states of UNESCO, the issue of media viability uh, was and is in the very center of this idea that information is a public good, but connected with another element that is very much related to the main topic of this session, that is the idea of we, we can't move forward without more transparency of the internet companies and particularly the social media companies because the algorithmic discussion that was also reported in this, in this work that FPU did for us is, ever, is obviously related to the transparency of the company. So uh, as, as you know, UNESCO is leading a global debate around the, the transparency of the internet companies. We, we launched it earlier this year during the World Press Freedom Day, this policy brief, let the sun shine in. And this debate uh, where the, the FPU research is, is, is connected, uh, just to give you a, a glance, is, is broader. We launched it earlier the, this month with, uh, with, jo with the presence of Joseph Stiglitz, because we want to connect this with the ideas of asymmetries of information. Uh, a first highlight of the World uh, UNESCO World Trends Report on Freedom of Expression and, and Media Development, which Courtney was involved in, in many different editions. And the key one of the key aspects precisely media viability. Uh, with the Economist Intelligence Unit, now it's called the Economist Impact uh, Report, we are launching uh, uh, earlier next year a lot of different uh, research also related to this issue. We are going to launch also an IPDC handbook with good practices uh, in January from different countries related to those topics. And finally, we are going to launch a policy brief that is being uh, co-authored with the International Center for Journalists and, and, and researchers from Columbia University, Anna Schiffer and Emily Bell and, and Julie Posette on those issues. So just to tell you that UNESCO is really betting a lot in these horses of media viability, but specifically on the, and I'm, I'm concluding uh, to, to tell two highlights, uh, specifically this report that we prepared with Free Press Unlimited. It's interesting because they did field research in 10 countries, Brazil, El Salvador, Indonesia, Jamaica, Lebanon, Namibia, Nigeria, Pakistan, Senegal, and Tunisia. And as you can imagine, there are several specific contexts and differences in the, in the challenges of media viability in those countries, but there are also some common trends. And in all of those countries, we heard the specific discussion of this session, that the way the algorithms of the, the major uh, social media platforms are calibrated, they not contribute for people to actually find the news they want to find in local independent media. Because their feed, their, their feed of news or the news feed uh, received the uh, specific indications that the algorithms want them to see. And we don't know exactly how those decisions are taken. So in all those different countries, we heard as concrete suggestions. And I, I, I have a few colleagues connected here later in the Q&A. They can offer more elements uh, that these small or, or medium-sized independent media outlets are claiming for a solution here, but they also realize that it's very difficult for them to interact directly with those social media giants. So one of the things they are precisely asking is for more media alliances around those issues. And that's why, for instance, these many actions I described uh, as UNESCO doing on media viability, we are doing in partnership with the world, uh, the world, uh, the ONIFRA, the World Association of News Publishers. And we have been also discussing this with the Inter-American Press Association, precisely because those big uh, media owners associations can be allies in these discussions with the big, the big tech uh, companies. So this, in a nutshell, this is a first, uh, a first uh, let's say, key finding of this report prepared by FPU regarding the key discussions of this. And just a second one, and then I finish. Obviously, the, the algorithmic element of this discussion is just one 
part of the problem. As Courtney was earlier describing, this is related to unfortunately a downsizing uh, of the overall situation of, of freedom of expression and press freedom in those countries as well. And this is related uh, with uh, empowering some government to take bad decisions related to media viability, which can impact in the phenomenon that we call media capture. And one of the things, and I will just see, quote this example that was underlined in this report, is how governments are misusing political and governmental advertisement uh, to fund the media outlets that they like, but not the others that they don't like which obviously is in the very center of idea of media capture. So anyways, we do think that having these concrete elements from 10 concrete countries from, a, from all regions is, is a very important contribution to this debate, aside of the global and more, let's say, overarching data that UNESCO have already released in November, and we will have more when we release this study with the Economist Impact Unit uh, earlier next year. So thank Thank you so much uh, for having me today. Over to you. Thank you very much, Guillermo. Uh, I think that's a very important place to start the discussion. You raised several issues. And what we want to get into now is a discussion around some of the solutions here. And we have really an expert panel that is working they are working on solutions. And so unlike a lot of the sessions at the IGF and a lot of the sessions where we talk about media and journalism, we're not gonna talk about uh, the, the problems, we're gonna talk about how do we address this, especially in the platform dominated algorithmic inflected uh, situation that we live in today. So I wanna turn now to our panel. And we're going to start with Dr. Claire Wardle, who uh, I'm delighted to be um, a, a co-visiting scholar with at the Center for Media at Risk at Annenberg. Uh, you have several different affiliations, including the co-founder and leader of First Draft, the world's foremost nonprofit focused on research and practice to address mis- and disinformation. And you're one of the world's leading experts on social media, user-generated content, and verification. And and that is really fundamental to journalism visibility in today's world. So you have been involved in several different initiatives that aim to scale this idea of uh, news, trust, and integrity. Can you describe what do those look like? How do those work? What solutions do those offer? Claire. Uh, so Courtney, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, it's lovely to see people on a screen in the same room. That seems very novel. Uh, and I'm sorry, I can't be in that room with you. But uh, but yes, yeah, so I spend uh, every day thinking about these challenges and the kind of the, the tr twin challenge of how do we make sure that the bad information is less easy to find? And how do we make sure that the good e information is easier to find? Whilst also recognizing the human aspects of this. So we have to think about the technical, but also the social elements of this. So we have to make changes, but we have to think through how people consume information and why. But um, I haven't directly been involved in building any of these initiatives, but I am, for full transparency, a board member of Trust.txt. I've worked with Olaf around thinking about these issues around how do we uh, understand which news outlets are credible or not. I've also worked with Sally Lemon on the Trust Project. And all of these initiatives are trying to do exactly this, which is how can audiences, how can consumers recognize what's trustworthy or not? And I'm sure Olaf will talk more about the specific challenges of, are you working at an article level or at an, an, an organization level? So we can all think about news organizations that generally are okay, but might have one particular part of that news organization that can be much more opinion led and isn't clearer. But the real challenge that everybody's trying to solve here is this idea of heuristics. So as humans, we're waiting for coffee, we're trying to get to sleep and we're scrolling. And when we're scrolling, everything online looks similar. And so our brains are looking for these cues to try and make sense of this. So there are these questions of the trust project or the work that Olaf's doing is enabling people to understand through a visual cue, this is a trustworthy organization. But then there are other elements to this, which is it's not about the consumers, it's about the platforms. So if I'm Google or Facebook or Instagram, how can I tell the difference between 
a news organization with a corrections policy, with editorial guidelines, with you know, policies around anonymous sources versus a blogger that has a very slick looking website. So my brain thinks, oh, that looks professional, but actually how can you tell the difference? So something like trust.txt is a text file that as a consumer, I don't see, but on the back end, the platforms can read that and make a, a distinction about what's a quality outlet or not. And a lot can of these, these kind of projects are working on that. Can you, can you just explain that? Cause I don't think most, I had never heard of this until I interviewed Jason the other day. Can you tell us, go tell us, what is that? How does that work? And why is it scalable? This idea that it's machine readable. So, so imagine you're um, a member of uh, an association, a news association, and you know it. And if I went digging on your website, I might learn that you're a member of that association. But it's very difficult to find. But the idea behind trust.txt is that we have these kind of trust relationships. You're a member of one EFRA. You, are, you syndicate to the Associated Press. But you either go digging for it, and most people don't. But if I'm a machine, how do I go digging? So this thing that's called a text file, basically, you, you know, you can see it, you can go digging if you look in the, the file of an online news site, but most people aren't doing that. But if I'm a Google and I'm, I'm trying to very quickly understand the same text that I can read that file and understand, that text file says this news outlet is connected to that one, that one, that one, that one, and that one. And this news organization is connected to that Twitter account and that Facebook account. So we all know when we're trying to verify an account, well, is that the official account? I don't know, it's difficult to tell. Does that blue check mean anything? Well, something like that trust.txt file allows the you as a consumer, but mostly it's designed for algorithms to read and say, that is connected to this and it's more trustworthy. So that scale question is something that it's relying on existing relationships of trust. So, you know, the work that Olaf is doing, for example, is going to a news organization and saying, are you trustworthy? This is saying, what are the existing relationships of trust and how can we make sense to a machine so that it can, you know, privilege that in the algorithm? Thank you for going to that level of detail. I think, you know, really understanding the mechanism is, is important here. Um, you also mentioned, you know, that, that some of this is about human cognition. Um, and some of this is also about the sustainability and the ability of news media to monetize, uh, the ability of it to be seen by advertisers as a legitimate place to place their advertisements. And so I want to go to Jason now, uh, who is the co-founder of NewsGain and joined Internews as the senior director of media business after NewsGain was acquired by Internews. And with more than 20 years of experience in advertising, digital media, technology, you've worked with media and development contexts around the world since 2008. And you have a track record of working to actually help the financial sustainability of news media, because that's the other side of this, right? You got to have uh, the, the economic support to actually create the news. So Jason, tell us what is ads for news and how do we think about some of the issues that Claire raised with respect to news media sustainability from a financial perspective? Sure. Um, well, thanks, Courtney. And uh, thanks, obviously, for the great chats that we had a few weeks ago um, that led to this discussion. Um, and then, Claire, I'm so happy that you brought up Trust TXT. It's a framework, actually, that I love um, because it's so elegant and so simple. And it has uh, actually broader applications, I think, than the ones that are being targeted right now. Um, I'll explain a bit about Ads for News and um, you know, where it came from. So back in 2017, as many of you know, many of the world's largest brands pulled their advertising from the big platforms after finding their ads were being placed next to extremist content on web pages. And the industry had a big wake up call. It was driven by brands and their consumers and they, they really said that something had to be done to stop this. What happened then was that the major agencies were pretty quick to act. They created uh, what's called exclusion lists of websites that publish material that contains so-called brand unsafe content. The market for tech tools grew that could detect this problem, and um, but the industry was already scarred by that point. So many brands felt, and they still do, that hard news is just too hot to handle. And over the years, in particular, in the face of the pandemic and Black Lives Matters, many brands blocked ads on any pages containing hard news. They felt that the, their brands were at risk by being seen amid these difficult topics. 
So the result for the news business, with all of the other stuff going on, has been devastating, as we all know. And the inevitable shift uh, to digital was accelerated during the pan pandemic. Um, and these legacy business models where you know, we really relied on advertising uh, for most of the revenue, they couldn't keep up, they couldn't support as we moved to digital. So last year, we at Internews did something a bit different. Uh, we already formed our United for News Coalition, uh, which is uh, with the World Economic Forum, two of the four largest media buying agencies in the world, the World Association of News Publishers and some major private sector media players. And we worked with our partners really quickly to create what's called an inclusion list of 8,000 trusted news media in 30 countries. That list is now available for free to media buyers, and it's our way of helping them to advertise on trusted news media. Some of the largest agencies now have access to the list, and they're using it to set their spending priorities from within their own ad management systems. But I've got to say, it is not easy work. Um, we're all swimming upstream in our mission to defund bad media. And I'm, I'm just going to highlight four issues. Um, would love to get uh, any questions or comments from the from the room on these as we go through the conversation. But the first one, of course, is what is trusted local news? And our view, my view, is that it's not our job to index the world. It's too big a job for us to do alone. We've developed our own standards. We have an indexing methodology, but we're automating as much of it as we can. And we're requiring media outlets to self-certify their compliance with those standards. Um, we're not trying to force our standards on the world. Uh, our approach is open. Wherever we can detect a reliable signal that a media outlet is trusted, we'll take it and we'll weight it accordingly. So there are some great standards out there. Um, and Claire, you've mentioned a few of them. One that we also use is GARM, the Global Alliance for Responsible Media, which specifies 11 types of content that are unacceptable. This is for, for brands especially. JTI is uh, fantastic in my view um, with its tier. JTI. You need to, sorry, no acronyms here, people. <laughs> yep, what is JTI? Initiative. Thank you. Um, it's it's uh, fantastic as well, as is Trust TXT, which as I've said, is like beautifully simple and easy for news websites and media associations to implement given their signals of trust. So that was the first issue. Second one is how can we make brands feel safe in news? And we've had a lot of conversations. It's quite revealing. We find that brands are fiercely protective of where they're seen, and that they have serious and well-founded concerns in some markets about aligning with independent news. It's a real concern for them that such public alignment or even being seen on an independent news website in some markets can risk their ability to operate and sell products. So while many will not advertise in news, they will advertise on a news website, but just on not on news pages. So they could go on things like sports pages. Is that where we want to be? Uh, my view is no, it's not. It's not far enough yet. Third is how can we ensure that our lists, our inclusion lists are kept up to date? This has been a real challenge, again, because it's a big, big uh, task to actually index the world or to, to scan news sites to detect if they're, they're uh, providing trusted information and trusted organizations. We have a new approach we're piloting now in the Philippines and Indonesia. The initial efforts are being worked into our funded programs. Beyond that, we want our local media association partners to receive a small percentage of ad revenue just from the media outlets that want us to represent them to buyers. That revenue will help to fund their work in keeping the lists updated and maintaining outreach to buyers. And we're, so we're essentially trying to bake sustainability and local ownership into this model from the get-go. Finally, uh, I just want to say something about how we make this scalable because this is really a common topic. We can all do our small things and have small successes, but for, for us to have a big impact, we have to create scalable solutions. And also how do we reach small media in the global south? Um, first of all, you have programmatic advertising, it's a volume business. So some very small media outlets will make negligible revenue from doing, from being with it, uh, ads for news. However, it doesn't uh, take much to make a difference. So all revenue is important. The fact is that many of the, the things that uh, a small media outlet should have in place to be successful with ads for news are also things that they should be doing to win and retain audiences, subscribers, and direct advertisers anyway. Um, so this comes to an important point. In fact, most of our wider work in media development that we do at um, Internews and also especially within my media business team at Internews is focused on small and medium sized media from the global south. This is what our core programs are for. With initiatives like Ads for News and also uh, the forthcoming Media Viability Accelerator that, we, uh, that was announced at the Summit for Democracy yesterday, we have the chance to actually punch out beyond our programs, to have these new conversations, to make bridges with each other and with the private sector and to learn more.
So that's that's really where we're at. Thanks. Thank you, Jason. And just a reminder, because we are at the Internet Governance Forum where we have so many different languages and levels of familiarity, I'm going to just ask everyone to avoid uh, acronyms. So I saw some people frantically looking. JTI is the Journalism Trust Initiative. Uh, and so with that, I want to turn to Olaf Steenfat, who heads the Media Ownership Monitor Project and Journalism Trust Initiative at the Reporters Without Borders, and uh, has been involved in media development for a long time. And RSF is also uh, the lead organization that, that created the Forum for Information and Democracy. So. Olaf, uh, RSF has a, a finger in a lot of these initiatives. Take us through what is JTI, Journalism Trust Initiative. And you know, you've, we've heard from Claire, we've heard from Jason about these different types of approaches. Where does the Journalism Trust Initiative fit in here? And how are you guys thinking about this? Especially because I'll note, you know, one of the things that you said is you're thinking about this idea of middleware. And uh, tell us, you know, what, what is that? Go ahead, Olaf. Uh, hello everyone, thank you so much for having me and actually to continue this conversation which uh, we are having for, for some time now. And I cannot agree more to what was said earlier that there is definitely a momentum. Some even say there is a disinformation industry already out there and lots and lots of trust projects, which is also um, or has a downside a little bit because if you um, take our main stakeholders, media outlets, definitely the bandwidth to engage is pretty limited. And usually kind of the responses we sometimes get is like, oh no, not another trust project. Um, and because of this, I wanted to say that this is really not true. So this is one piece of maybe mis or malinformation uh, because there are not hundreds of projects. There are maybe a dozen or so. And what matters maybe even more is that we are confronted with a very complex problem where it is actually good and, a, and an advantage to have many, many different actors and you know just trials to basically test and explore the best, the best solution. And we are also very still very early on in this process to find the best solution. And this is very important to mention. And secondly, I think all of us agree that there won't be a silver bullet. So we are all of us building different building blocks, which solve different parts of the problem and the puzzle. And I think the biggest challenge we face is interoperability to really, you know, put these different pieces of the puzzle um, together and, and obviously then uh, solve the, the problem or at least uh, parts of it. Which brings me to the term you mentioned earlier, middleware, which comes from uh, Francis Fukuyama. I think he published an article in Foreign Policy last year, where he basically, if I understood correctly, in a nutshell, said something like, let's imagine we won't succeed in breaking up the monopolies of big tech, um, search and social media. But even then, we can create a middle layer of different tools and instruments and plugins between big tech and the consumer, which offer choice, which actually empower the user in many, many different ways and create pluralism, even if at the very end, we still have monopolies um, in, in certain areas. And I think following this train of thought, what we are trying to build, most of us, are pieces of middleware, not only business to consumer, but also business to business when it comes to uh, the uh, relationship, for example, of media outlets and, and, and advertisers, for example. And when it comes to journalism, I think it's really fair to say we are kind of facing a yogurt moment uh, where consumers more and more look at the packaging and are really interested in knowing what's in it, what the ingredients are, who the owner of the factory is. And this is a little bit ironic because journalism is all about ac accountability of others, accountability of politicians, accountability of you know, businesses. And suddenly this is a deep look into the mirror. It's our own accountability. And I think um, when it comes to trust, at the end of the day, it's all about accountability and compliance. Um, the, the big question I think we have to ask ourselves 
do we stick to our own professional norms, which largely exist, and what happens if we don't? And this is, I think, where um, not only the, only the Journalism Trust Initiative kicks in, but I think many, many initiatives in the field at the moment. Um, for the Journalism Trust Initiative, I think we believe three different ingredients are needed to make this work. And this pretty much also relates to, to what you said earlier. Um, the first one is scalability. And for that reason, we choose very early on the protocol of ISO, the International Standardization Organization, as an instrument, not only to, to build and draw up and also govern the list of criteria, um, in a non-proprietary way, um, but also to implement it in terms of um, conformity assessment and certification, because this is a system which is out there already. It's self-regulatory, it's the industry getting its act together, it's the opposite of a law, and it is um, tested and scalable, because ISO exists in the DNA of almost any corporation in other fields like accounting, like CSR, like waste management, like technical domains. And we're just applying this instrument, this existing infrastructure for um, the case of editorial standards. So this is the question of scalability and, um, and implementation. The second uh, ingredient, which again was mentioned already is um, machine readability. Um, you really need to translate whatever the compliance mechanism is. At the end of the day, you need to translate it into a real-time uh, data channel, which feeds into search, social media, and maybe even more importantly, programmatic advertising to provide um, a competitive advantage to uh, compliance sources. And this is pretty much an IT task in, in a number of ways. As you can guess, this is not exactly what we at Reporters Without Borders usually do, but a very, very steep learning curve there. And last not least, um, it is about obviously an enabling environment of, of regulation and co-regulation, um, which is also a little bit, um, you might say even weird, we find, because if you look into digital policies at the moment, be it at national levels, be it transnational, it's all about sanctions. It's always about deleting harmful content, chasing malicious actors. And I think pretty much all of us know, and particularly from parenting, if you are parents, sanctions only never work if you want to impact behavior. You also need incentives. You need a mix of sanctions and incentives uh, to, to really um, to move forward. And this is exactly why we believe in digital policies. Sanctioning harmful content is not enough. You need um, due prominence. You need rules to amplify trustworthy sources and provide discoverability. And by the way, and maybe in concluding, there are lots and lots of examples from legacy analog broadcast regulation, which at the day was basically called must carry, where the scarcity was on the supply side spectrum, basically. And there were lots and lots of laws still existing today to basically oblige, for example, cable operators to carry certain programs, local media, for example, public media. This was a legal concept. And I think currently where this, the scarcity has moved from the supply to the demand side, our attention basically, it's not any longer about must carry, but it's about must be found. It's about regulation and obligations that really provide due prominence and discoverability obligations for intermediaries. And this is, I mean, if this were to, you know, happen, where all these, you know, tools and in instruments we built together um, would actually be pretty much needed to make it work. And I leave it there and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Olaf. Um, I think you, you know, you you really hit the nail on the head, which is the, the I mean, you raised many key issues, but I think this idea that a lot of the kind of regulatory frameworks that are out there are insufficient for the information environment in which journalism is attempting to exist today. Um, and 
the fact that we want self-regulatory mechanisms and that there are lots of initiatives as we've just heard from all the panelists. And I wanna thank the panelists for the detail that you provided because you know the, the devil is in the details. Um, and so that's an important element. And I want to invite people uh, in the chat on Zoom as well as in the room, which I'm really delighted to see is quite full to come up to the microphone or raise your hand uh, in the chat so that we can incorporate your questions, your thoughts um, on this uh, as we continue the conversation. So, you know, if you're interested, please come up to the mic. I, I wanna first take the moderator's uh, prerogative and raise a couple of questions that are particularly relevant, I think, at the Internet Governance Forum, which is in, countries where they, there is relatively little um, uh, connectivity, uh, where there are you know, very few or limited independent news outlets, and where they are in many different languages, several of which are not well supported by integrity initiatives, where um, still figuring out how this works to read languages that are not in uh, Western text. Are the solutions that you guys are working on uh, scalable to, okay, thought we lost you, but I don't think we did. Excellent. Are the solutions that you are working on scalable to the last mile, to those countries that are less connected, that have fewer news sources, that can't compete in the engagement algorithms because the audiences are too small and how does this work in other non-western character languages um and i'm gonna go to claire uh first to to respond to that and again invite the audience to please uh raise their hands or come up to the mic if they want to jump in after we go through the panel thank you yeah so courtney i mean this to me is the most important question and we, we know that platforms themselves are really bad at understanding what's happening globally. But I'd also say in terms of a lot of the trust initiatives that many of them have been built in the US or Western Europe. And then ultimately when trying to scale into different parts of the world, there's this sudden sense of like, oh, I didn't understand what was happening there. So in the same way, as we say about platforms, we need more research, more understanding, more partnerships with people on the ground you know, we should be doing a lot more of that in terms of, of the kind of initiatives that we're talking about, because there isn't an easy way to scale. And certainly I've been in meetings where people kind of go through their credibility indicators and then somebody from Nigeria will say, we're really going to struggle to apply any of them. So does this mean that you're working closely with Google? Google is going to start, you know, pushing us down because we have a completely different media ecosystem. So you know, I remember when two years ago, YouTube started labeling state media and they labeled the BBC. And of course, the Brits were like, oh, it's not state media, but there's complexity there around funding. And there isn't an easy way of describing different media ecosystems, which is exactly what you're saying, Courtney. So I wish that there was more funding to spend more time on the ground in places to say, well, what does credibility look like in Thailand? What does it look like in Malawi? Because Without that, without a true understanding, we're not gonna be able to scale or we're gonna scale with some really problematic unintended consequences that we've seen the platforms do. So I think we have to learn from the mistakes they've made to say, we can't scale similarly unless we have a true understanding of what's happening on the ground. Thank you, Claire. And uh, before I go to Jason, I just wanna raise, you know, that this this issue, this, this idea of unintended consequences, you know, we're seeing this in the Digital Services Act where there's a big debate over whether there should be a journalistic or a media exemption. Uh, and with some people arguing that, yes, that needs to be embedded, others saying, no, that's gonna to lead to more disinformation. So again, I feel like this idea of how you establish news integrity and trust uh, has many different applications. Um, but Jason, I wanna to go to you with the same question about scalability, smaller markets, other languages. Yeah, thanks, Courtney. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, an interesting thing, and it comes back to some points that both Claire and Olaf have made already. Um, one that Olaf made about what's the purpose of the indicator, and we have all these what do you call middleware type solutions, um, which are you know, the, the kinds of things that we're working on. And um, I'll give you an example. So you'll see if you go to our adsfornews.org website, 
you'll see uh, 30 countries, many of them are not what you would think of as typical targets for the kind of development work that we do. Um, we chose those markets initially because we spoke with uh, the people that we're making the product for, which were the agencies, and that's why they're on there, to try and get them hooked in. And then within that list, we want to slide in the things that we really care about and we really sell, which is you know, those those small and those those markets in the global south mostly. Um, so what, what are these indicators for and what's this work for? Um, in our kind of purest sense with ads for news, we're trying to drive ad revenue, but in some markets, we realize that that's not such uh, an easy thing or a developed thing. Uh, case in point being Zimbabwe. So Zimbabwe, mostly uh, online in English language, but there is no programmatic advertising market there to speak of right now. Um, but still, we're going to be going there uh, as part of our programs because we still believe it's useful to create lists of trusted media within that country. Our other two pilots are in Indonesia and Philippines. I just looked up the number of uh, languages, I think, in uh, the Philippines. It's 120. And the way that we're dealing with that, like we do with most of our work, in fact, is to forge these you know, very trusted, strong relationships with local partners that can help us to do the work and to decipher the markets and to help us to understand local context. So we're, you know, while our, our main program work is this, that's what we're really using to do the, the working country, we are trying to adapt this uh, framework or our approach actually to the markets that might be less obvious um, targets for programmatic advertising. But it's, you know, we're, it, it really is, uh, we can't claim in any of this that we've cracked the code. Um, although we have the solutions yet, but what we what we have here is a, a platform to have wider conversations and to think more broadly about and test things as well about how we can solve these these issues. Uh, thanks so much, Jason. I mean that the labor intensity is certainly something that relates to scalability. Um, I want to go to Olaf to address this question, then we'll go to a question in the chat and in the room. Olaf. Thank you so much. We try to follow the do no harm principle, which sounds nice, but it's in, in, you know, in practical terms, sometimes really difficult because you end up doing nothing if you really take it seriously. So I think the only um, recipe against is testing, thorough testing of, of whatever instruments you try to implement in, you know, just the maximum variety of sizes and markets you can get. And this is what we did with the JTI, um, the Journalism Trust Initiative quite intensely. And I must say lots and lots of learnings there. Just, you know, one anecdotal, you know, not even evidence, just example, where a media outlet was overconfident and, you know, basically telling us, yeah, let's, you know, do this, get certified and, and you know, shine. Just to find out that they, don't even have editorial guidelines. I mean, zero. And then they said, yeah, we'll have an oral tradition, kind of we talk to each other. And this was not in Togo or in uh, Bolivia, but in Canada. So um, I guess what I'm saying is that going through the process, no matter where, north, south, east, west, is a very important inroads for media development. Also, it's a diagnostic process to actually detect flaws and deficiencies, address them, upskill your staff and come out of this process better as an institution, but of course, also the journalism that, that's being produced. I think a question I would have, particularly for the trust.txt concept, and this maybe also illustrates what I said earlier, we need di different building blocks for different markets maybe and, and, and questions is, if you go through associations as one main node and, and data point of, of trust, what happens in a country like Egypt, where membership of an association actually means the exact opposite? Um, and then somebody has to make a decision which association is worth to be used as you know, um, a validation um, principle or not. So this kind of just to illustrate a little bit the complexity, what we are dealing with really um, is what matters. Thank you, Olaf. And sorry, just one. I, yeah, go ahead, Guillermo. You wanted to jump in on this as well. Yeah, no, very quickly, two things. Unfortunately, I will need to excuse myself because I have a flight to catch and I will need to leave. But I think your question is very important uh, and people already spoke. So I just want to emphasize another side of it, the, the linguistic aspect, is also related to our difficulties to listen to what's going on on the field. 
because we are grasping things in the languages we can understand, uh, with the networks we are connected. But my impression working for such a global organization like UNESCO is that every, try, every time we dig a little bit further, we find a very interesting example that we were not aware of. Maybe they are not as, as structured as we would like to be, but I think we need also to uh, amplify our own capacity of consulting, of engaging new ideas, of trying to see a little bit further of our own schemes on this area. And I finish with this, uh, with the pandemic, we, we have launched a program for uh, training journalists in reporting on the COVID-19 crisis and on the vaccines. And we have engaged more than 10,000 people from 150 countries. We offered courses in 13 languages, including Olaf, et cetera. And those journalists that were engaging with us because they wanted to receive the trainings, et cetera, they also started to send in ideas and information and what they are doing. So I think, uh, I, I don't, I, I'm not sure if I agree with Olaf that there are only those and things happening. I, I think there are much more happening uh, out there, but maybe we don't have the capacity to map adequately all of these. And we need to coordinate more and see how we can create synergies. And your question on the linguistic element is absolutely relevant on this in both sides, in, in helping uh, these with the, the proper linguistic elements, but also being able to listen to this conversation in ways that not necessarily we are capable of. You know? Thank you, and sorry to need to leave earlier. Well, thank you so much for that intervention. I think that's a great point. Uh, our ability to listen it fundamentally impacts what we believe there could be in terms of solutions. Um, so thank you again for, for taking the time today. I want to, speaking of engagement, now turn to the floor here and then bring in a question from the chat. Please go ahead and introduce yourself. Hello, my name is uh, Rishik. Uh, I used to work for a media organization. No, I don't work for a media organization, but um, I've been somewhere around the, the Dynamic Coalition for about two years. And I noticed that two years ago, we were discussing basically the same things, uh, which is how to deal with the platforms, how to, how to find a way for media organizations to be able to live in this digital environment where, where platforms are where they need to publish and 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 all of that. Uh, and it's two years later, and we're still discussing this. Um, and my take on this is that uh, we now know that Facebook is an abuser, right? We kind of suspected this for years, but now it's all out. We know the inter we've read the internal memos, we've read the internal documents. And I'm going to say that the media, um, the relationship between media organizations and Facebook is an abusive relationship. That's what it is. And we, we have to name it this way, right? And the more we talk about how we can try to change the platforms or build something between us and the platforms or the, the middleware or, or anything like that, the more we sound like we're, we're basically saying, oh, we can change him. Uh, we cannot. This is, this is not going, going to happen. Uh, somebody said in a very nice short way, protocols, not platforms. Instead of having those monopolized silos, we need a protocol. We need an infrastructure layer where Facebook is just one of the players, right? Where, where Twitter is just one of the players, not the player that you have to engage with, right? Um, such protocols exist. I'm not going to get into the technical details, but I would like us as, as the media ecosystem to start treating them seriously because I'm available on those other uh, wonderful platforms and those other wonderful, for wonderful platforms implement things basically like trust takes txt right now right on my phone this is my profile and link to my blog has a nice green check mark because there's a way to do this right even though the blog is a separate thing i don't know how much time effort energy money will take for facebook to implement trust trust txt in any meaningful way but there are platforms out there that actually do something similar already we just we just choose not to be on them maybe that's that's something we should uh, reconsider thank, thank you, you. Thank you so much for for that input. Um, you know this idea, and, and I would I would hope that that is part of the conversation we're having today. Is that this is not about how do we exist in the Facebook ecosystem. This is about I mean we're talking about protocols, standards, and getting outside of the platforms. But I very much hear this. The fact is we are you know it is kind of like uh, an abusive spouse in a relationship that they just can't get away because 
you depend on them monetarily, you know, they own your house, they own your audience, uh, you know, so it's, it's complicated. Thank you so much for that, that input. And I'm, and I definitely want to hear from the, the panel on that, but I'm going to just bring in two more questions. One from Julius Endert on the chat, which is maybe kind of along the same lines, which is this idea about blockchain for trust. Um, does blockchain offer, is that a protocol or an, uh, is that some part of the solution? Um, and then also I want to invite Dan, uh, who said he has a comment and a question to uh, jump in here with your question, but also if you could please mention the example from Somaliland about a very local initiative to uh, Guillerme's point earlier about listening on the ground. So with that, I'm gonna start with Dan and then go to the panelists. Great, thanks, Courtney. Yeah, no, I think your question um, about you know linguistics to me is really about the topic of visibility, which is you know at SEMA we're really interested in you know what do these kind of conversations mean about news ecosystems in, in developing countries, some of the countries with the least capacity. And it seems to me that you know a lot what we hear of when we're engaging with these uh, news outlets is that they they don't feel like any of the large platforms can actually see them or you know they're not visible could be for linguistic purposes, could be for market size isn't of interest enough. Um, and so there is a lot of complexity out there that we're not capturing. And I think that was also what Guillermo was, was getting at too, that there's a lot of work to do, be done on our side. And there's this you know, fantastic example of uh, Markadi in Somaliland actually, which you know they wanted to develop a, a, a trust platform that would enable Somali um, users when they were, uh, browsing news sites to understand what the level of trust is in each of these, uh, uh, each of the um, news sites in their country. So they developed their own kind of uh, platform. And I think it was a, a, a browser add on, but also maybe like a, a, a download app that you could use in, in Somaliland that actually then attends to the specific context of that country, or, you know, uh, actually, it's a country that's kind of <laughs> not even fully recognized necessarily, right? So it, it's going down to that granular level of understanding trust and within that specific context, a trusted civil society organization trying to, to do this. So I think it's gonna be a mix of both of those, uh, those, those kind of global standards doing protocols that can work you know, at the middleware as well as kind of bottom up efforts that look to then plug into them. I think there's gonna be probably a mix there. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say, you know, um, uh, SEMA and Luminate, uh, funded research by Sember Media this year that was looking at, you know, digital native news outlets in 12 countries and developing countries. And there are signs that some of these organizations are actually flourishing in the digital age. It's not all of them. And obviously it's a very hard uh, environment, but I think it does also speak to the idea that, yes, you know, some of the, the platforms that we all know are really important, but it's not necessarily an overall impediment. It's a, it's a significant challenge, one that everyone in, in that kind of research also encountered. But there are ways um, that we can support these types of uh, news outlets that are doing hard hitting uh, independent journalism. They're often small, they often don't have a lot of capacity, but they're breaking really hard hitting stories. And some of them actually are financially viable. I'm going to share the link to that research in the chat, but I think it just also goes to show that uh, I mean, I'm not undermining this conversation. This is super important, but there are also other aspects to viability that go beyond the platforms in the digital age that we need to think about. And what does that look like? You know, just one interesting tidbit is that, you know, organizations that spent more time uh, with resources on kind of prioritizing and, and, and shaping their uh, content for digital spaces were more financially viable, right? So we're also just understanding that news organizations also need to shift and understand um, how to best place their products in a different type of environment. So there's there's other components to it. So just you know reiterating, you know, there's I think there's going to be a top you know two sides of it that need to come together, and we need to figure out how to make that work. And then also that there are some green shoots that are working. And we need to figure out how to to strengthen those. Um, so I'd just love to hear the 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 panels panelists thoughts on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Dan. And I do want to note that the Dynamic Coalition did try to get Makati to, uh, you know, be part of this conversation. Um, and I know that there is an outlet in New Zealand that has decided not to be on Facebook uh, completely and, you know, go their own way. So there are there are different approaches, but let's hear from the panel. And um, Olaf, I'm going to start with you this time. You know, 
how should we be thinking about creating uh, an infrastructure that is not platform dependent, especially on Facebook? And is blockchain part of the solution? Uh, well, a li little bit disappointment there. I have nothing to say about blockchain, really. <laughs> I'm sorry. That, that's uh, absolutely and, fine. <laughs> definitely at the moment, not on our list of things to consider for, for the Journalism Trust Initiative. Um, I think briefly on what was said earlier, um, again, what we are trying to build is not solving every problem here, but um, I think a few just learnings from our journey are very early on we've asked ourselves the question for example would we build different list of criteria different sets of standards for different types of media or in different contexts in other words would we give a discount on ethics and the clear decision was taken to say no we don't what we are building the, the baseline standard should fit for everyone and should be built like this and then we need additional features and um, offers to support media outlets to get there, which is a, a different approach. And maybe even in terms of te terminology, I mean, standards, plural, is an oxymoron, right? If you have 10 standards, it's not a standard anymore. So this is why we believe, particularly in the global internet, for some problems, you need kind of a global platform and a global approach, which of course does not exclude. I mean, it's the exact opposite um, to have localized solutions as well. You know, and this is what I meant earlier by interoperability. That's the real challenge to, to connect these different, these different elements. And I can only um, speak about the ISO world, which we are kind of using as an instrument. And this is working globally in different industries, particularly in the global south, if you think of, you know, lumber or food products, um, et cetera, and the respective, uh, you know, protocols and certification remarkably well. And, you know, the question for us was, are we inventing something from scratch other than ISO or using this, this system which exists already? Thank you. And by ISO, I believe you're referring to the International Standards Organization, correct? Correct. Great. Yes. Um, okay, thank you. So let me go to you, Jason. What is your thoughts in response to the various different questions raised? Thanks, Courtney. Um, so regarding the question from Julius about blockchain for trust, um, I don't have a great deal of experience with blockchain, but I think it is, um, and it, I'd, I'd actually welcome if Julius could um, explain more actually about what the question is. Um, but uh, if I think about the, the principle of blockchain in, in terms of uh, decentralizing, uh, then I think that is um, valuable in some way. Uh, it, internally with some colleagues the other day, I had a conversation about um, one particular country where uh, the space is closing or has closed rather rapidly. And it's a case of uh, not just uh, identifying which citizen journalisms, uh, journalists uh, in a country um, are producing good content and can be trusted, but also potentially about how to get them paid. So you're using things like non-fungible tokens, et cetera, to, to find ways to get money to them, which is quite difficult right now. So I think there's a lot there. The problem with blockchain for me is it's, um, it's just kind of hard to decipher and I haven't seen anything that really makes it super tangible. Um, but if there are ways to do that, that would be uh, very interesting. Thank you. And we ha do have someone in the room raising their hand so I, we can connect you afterwards. Uh, Claire, over to you, same question, if you wanna to respond to some of the questions raised. So I'll start with a blockchain question, which is, I think, like everyone, there's this sense of, well, surely that's the answer. The thing about journalism is it's really messy and complex. And my concern about blockchain is that there are some things that you actually don't want to be immutable. I do think there's some interesting work being done around verifying content from trusted providers that could help in the detection of deep fakes. So there's kind of like the New York Times and the BBC are working on something called Project Origin, which enables them to kind of, you know, use that kind of technology to say this is definitely ours and that there's nothing you can do this isn't about adding a watermark it's and something like that I think is is interesting but I think until the messiness that Olaf is talking about until we can get this right in a human manual sense I feel very nervous about bringing blockchain in to solve these kind of problems I think the question about 
platforms, historians are going to look back at 2012 to 2016 and said, we were asleep at the wheel. We were so excited about the ways we thought that platforms could have all the solutions. We failed to watch what it meant for basically Mark Zuckerberg through Facebook, WhatsApp and Instagram to you know, create this ecosystem that has a network effect that is just off, the, off, literally off the scale. So I think to this point about, yes, we need middleware, we need all of these things. I'm somebody who is constantly thinking about the kind of sociology of this. We saw with the blackout, he has created a utility, a communications utility that the network effects are so great on these platforms. Yes, I really hope that from a regulatory perspective, one of the things that's a priority is in interoperability. But we have to then in, in educate people into moving their data off to other platforms, creating a dynamic marketplace of different platforms. I'm just saying, I think this is going to be much harder than we think because we allow this behemoth to grow. And yes, do we like it? No. But unfortunately, you know, the planet is using globally is using these, particularly these three networks for almost everything. And as we know, the kind of free basics idea that many people use it as the internet means I share all of the concerns that the person who asked the question has. But when I think about what it means to really move people away from the things that their community, their network is on, it's going to be a huge uphill battle. And I hate myself, I hate all of us that we invited the platforms to these kind of conferences. We really thought we could work with them. And we, we're now being like, oh! they've created this framework that makes it incredibly hard for us to do. So yes, 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 we need interoperability. We need different protocols. And I think trying to build those protocols on top of the platforms with an idea to where are we in 10 years time? We're not gonna solve any of these in the next two years. We will have this conference panel in two years. We just will. We need to be okay with that and to say, well, where are we gonna be in 10, 20, 30 years time? And that's the kind of conversations I think we should be having. Uh, thank you, Claire. You got some some laughs and cheers in the room. So I think there's a lot of agreement with you on several of those points, including, if I may, you know, the the person who asked the question works for one of the lead worked for one of the leading investigative journalism organizations in the world that has the organize, organized crime and corruption reporting project, which has revealed massive malfeasance um, by you know leading public figures around the world. And so it's super important to be thinking about all the different dimensions um, of journalism and, and what you know, what it means to actually have immutability, as you're saying, um, the platforms. And, you know, if I may just take the, the opportunity to kind of comment on when we look back at 2012 to 2016, I think you're right, you know, and part of this is because these dominant platforms were created in a regulatory environment that doesn't, that sees government as bad, that sees regulation as bad versus as a way to be in the public service. Um, but as somebody who, you know, spent time on the ground in Egypt, which was mentioned earlier, um, with the movements that were growing there to bring about change, like these are double-edged swords. They're, you know, they do provide an opportunity to publish in very closed media ecosystems to uh, to cover issues like human rights abuses and police violence um, in countries where otherwise there would be no outlets. So, you know, very double-edged. I wanna go to the room now. We have another question. So I'm gonna invite you to go to the microphone, please. And then also as you're going up there, I wanna bring in a point made by uh, Guy Berger at UNESCO, who noted that scale is not just a technical and linguistic issue, but also something that requires building national alliances so that journalism outlets in a country can overcome differences and really drive viability solutions. And this depends in part on what proportions of ads are transnational versus national and local. So he's not sure that there can be a global approach and wanted to hear the thoughts from the panelists on that. So uh, we will go to that, but I wanna invite the uh, person in the room to please ask, identify yourself and ask your question. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Annie Zaman. Uh, I'm a journalist who, uh, is it louder? Okay. My name is Annie Zaman. I'm a journalist. Uh, I was in Myanmar quite recently and I'm a co-founder of Myanmar Media Support Network. So uh, 
I have a question for JTI uh, because I was going through your website and I was uh, looking at it and thinking who are the uh, market, you know, who are the media houses who have joined or got like carrot and stick rewards like uh, from JTIA because it would be really good to know uh, who these media houses are and it should be on their, your website. Uh, I have tried to look for it, but I couldn't find. Uh, the other thing is, uh, Coming from Myanmar, you know, and working there, uh, we have learned after the coup that be it Facebook, be it Twitter, be it Instagram, people are so uh, wise, you know, we generally tend to think that citizens are dumb uh, and uh, we, we don't focus on digital literacy at times. We keep thinking about like policing a lot, but what we have seen in Myanmar that people don't trust uh, Facebook anymore. They don't trust their own government, A, of course, like it's a military, uh, Tatmadaw is there, but they also don't use Facebook anymore. So in conflict-ridden societies, what are the solutions when we talk about uh, integrity and um, news integrity and trust? Because both the sides, be it pro-democracy uh, or be it like uh, the military, th there's like propaganda, there's war, you know, in this situation, who should we trust and how should we build uh, uh, I don't know uh, whether policies, who would build that, UNESCO would come in there, or uh, like, uh, I was very keen to know more about JTI, you know, because we would like to know and be supported by these kind of initiatives. Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. I'm going to go to Olaf first in that case to address the specific question and then to the other um, panelists to, to address both kind of that, that question as well as the one raised by Guy in the chat. So Olaf, over to you. Yes, thank you for the question and, and the interest. I think the reason for this is that very early on we thought it's maybe not such a good idea to turn the JTI website in a registry for media outlets that use it or publish their you know, compliance uh, transparency reports because we le really leave it up to the media outlets to do it on their own. Um, I, I can tell you we have a, currently a number of around a little under 100 media outlets uh, using the JTI in different stages. Uh, you would find there um, a number of national television broadcasters, public broadcasters as well, like CBC Radio Canada, France Television, um, Irish, Norwegian, Swiss. Um, also large um, commercial publishing group like Shipstead, for example, in Norway with newspapers, daily newspapers in Sweden and, and Norway. You would see a number of um, smaller and I would say more alternative um, examples of Tiempo Argentino, for example, which is member owned or The Wire in India. Um, as well as, you know, community and local radio stations, Studio Kalangu in Niger. So it's, it's a broad, broad picture, really. Thank you, Olaf. And if you don't mind, I will pass your information on to our colleague here in the room after the session. Um, let me go to the rest of the panelists to address kind of both of these questions. We've got Myanmar, very specific situation. You've got, you know, the pros and cons in our face right there, um, as well as to, to Guy's questions around, you know, whether there can be a global approach. And I think this, you know, also links with the question around Myanmar. So uh, Claire, over to you first. I hate to be the person that says it's a hybrid, but <laughs> I think a guy is absolutely right, which is that there are certain things, and this is Olaf's point too, which there are certain things, particularly around ethics, that almost we should say there should be a global ethical approach. But then I do think in terms of actually on the ground making this work, I mean, it's wonderful to hear the colleague from Myanmar. I mean, who are we to even have an ounce of understanding what's happening in Myanmar and to, to really understand that landscape, the newness of what it means to, to have a free press in a country like Myanmar. So I feel like we're not very good at coming up with hybrid approaches. And of course the platforms want scale, but we see that they're now having to apply different kind of regulatory responses due to jurisdictions around a particular country. And I think, what does it look like for us to think similarly around that, which is we want there to be certain core values, but with a recognition of, you know, I remember even at First Draft, we tried to do work with partners in, in um, the APAC region. And just, we went, you know, on a couple of trips there and said, we've really got, you know, this is insane for us to try and connect with using the same kind of models. And this was back in 2016. And so I think it is a hybrid model, what that looks like in practice, how you resource that 
which it always comes back to resourcing. Um, but I think Guy's right. And that's why, you know, an organization like UNESCO that has that global view, but with an ability to connect with partners on the ground, it has to be the key to this to make it sustainable. And, and again, prevent the unintended consequences. Uh, thank you so much, Claire. Uh, Jason, your thoughts on this question? Yeah, sure. I can respond to both um, this one regarding Myanmar and also uh, Guy's question. So uh, Myanmar, I've been working with media in Myanmar since 2015, I think, um, all across the country, and not just with the larger independents, but also with the ethnic media uh, across the country. And I, I have to say, Myanmar is a standout market uh, in all of them that we worked with globally. So you know, it went from something like 4% internet penetration to more than 100% um, within the space of five or six years. Um, Facebook became the internet and it was, I remember going there and trying to actually leave the Facebook environment to get out onto websites and we got pop-up messages saying, you're now leaving the Facebook environment. And it was a major discouragement even for us to leave that environment um, to, to go out to, to websites because the websites were slow and inefficient. They, they chewed data and it was very difficult to use. So um, as for you know, how to establish which media are trusted in Myanmar, it's a super difficult situation there right now because you know, all of the media that were essentially operating in the country are now forced to work in exile. And um, there's a lot of citizen journalism, in fact, that's coming out of the country. And then you know, what's the, how balanced is that? actually, when it's not by, uh, by people trained in journalism. So this is, it actually kind of relates back to my previous comment about uh, blockchain. So uh, I don't have the answers regarding Myanmar, except to say that it is a very, very unusual market, a very special market. Um, to Guy's question, or to, sorry, to Guy's comment rather about scale and uh, creating these alliances of journalism outlets. So I, I made reference, and it, it wasn't a shameless plug, but um, to some research that we put out in um, yeah, earlier this year in June. Um, and this was about finding ways to gather data, performance data on media businesses. Um, so what works and what doesn't. But like any business, that's your own secret source. You don't want to share that with everybody uh, in a way that can be reconciled back to you or your country or your competitors. So we suggested a framework that could be applied that would essentially obfuscate or de-identify this data uh, so that it would be characterized by media type and media outlet type. So that um, we actually define 16 types, it's just an idea for a framework, but that something where performance data could be shared um, and where, excuse me, and where um, benchmarks, your know, media could, could uh, instead of operating in a silo, they could say, oh, how well are we actually doing and compare themselves to others and then you know, set their targets. Um, and that has been really exciting in the fact that um, I've now spoken with nine organizations, some of them in this room, um, to help us to define what that solution should be. So we're, we're really trying hard to create something that's bigger than our own programs and our own interests to do something at the sector level. Um, yeah, and I'd like to talk to anybody that's got an interest in discussing that. Great, um, thanks so much for that. I, I wanna just uh, focus on a couple of things that have been raised before we turn to kind of the final section to talk about where do we go from here and what's next? You know, we mentioned free basics and I don't know if everyone knows what that is, but it's basically Facebook's uh, subsidized data plan so that um, you can use Facebook without using your data. That has all sorts of implications for the news media and we have discussed that at previous, um, I don't know if we had it at the IGF, but we certainly had it at RightsCon um, and I believe the Center for International Media Assistance has done some reporting on that. So I would encourage, um, people to find that and maybe ask Dan if you can search out those links and stick them in the chat. Uh, that That's a really critical aspect to how we think about this because, of course, which media outlets are on those subsidized uh, data plans or subsidized platforms, it's going to have a significant impact. And usually those uh, subsidizations are created in concert with the government, which has all sorts of implications um, for media freedom. And Myanmar is such an interesting example because uh, not only where we've seen the transition to democracy and then the coup, but also you know the the focus of disinformation in that environment and really the in, the role of information operations, the challenge that uh, 
legitimate media have had in that country to be seen. There was a, a recent report that there were troll farms, not troll farms, sorry, clickbait farms in Cambodia and Vietnam that were using Facebook live video, sorry, they were using live Facebook live videos, repurposing them and reposting them simply to be uh, to raise money because they were getting then funding through the monetization schemes on Facebook and Google like AdSense um, and of course then making them look like live videos when they aren't live videos which is a whole nother dimension this issue of you know deep and shallow fakes and, and authenticity which I don't think we're going to have time to get into here although if any of the panelists want to address that in their final kind of wrap-up remarks I think that would be really important because as we uh, uh, get further into the the you know sophistication of machine learning and uh, these tools to create inauthentic uh, audio video etc that's going to pose an even greater challenge to the issue of news integrity and trust so with that um in the you know we have a few minutes left i want to just really quick see whether there are any last questions from the audience here or in the chat and seeing none uh that will give us the remainder of the time therefore to hear from the panelists and so I would like to hear from all of you, uh, just you know, a couple of minutes, uh, maybe take one minute each. Final thoughts, where do we go from here? What do we need to pay attention to? And what are, what are you focused on uh, in the coming year? And let's start with Olaf. Uh, thank you. This also allows me to uh, come back to um, Guy's point earlier, because in his statement, um, there is a, a deeper layer um, of, of, of dimension in this. Because if we speak about trust so much, it's not only about media outlets, journalists on the one hand and the consumer on the other, or media and advertisers, but trust also matters a lot between journalists uh, in working together. And particularly at times where we work more and more remotely, where we have new models of distributed journalism, of teams working on a project for a limited amount of time, you really need to trust each other to work on a project together as journalists, particularly across borders and particularly in, in investigative journalism. And this is where for the journalism trust initiative, at least in, in, in one field, we are moving into uh, by saying we can provide a value-based environment where individual journalists and media outlets and associations and different types of stakeholders can collaborate uh, on this platform based on a certain understanding and also um, a pledge and really a commitment to certain principles, which we believe is, is super important and was, was really um, not um, really tackled and, and addressed too much in the past. So this is like kind of what we can, can offer as a, as a uh, look forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Olaf. What about you, Jason? Um, yeah, I think I've got two main points, really. Uh, one is that um, when we work with media outlets, we see a lot of um, well, what we want to see working differently is that they take much more um, active role in becoming trusted. It's much more difficult now than ever to become a trusted media outlet, to get recognized as so. Um, and the, the benefits from doing that um, will be significant, I think, as we go forward in this you know, much more, more kind of clouded space that we're working in now. Um, last comment really is just about um, this kind of measurement of trust and integrity still being kind of a new space. Like any market in its infancy, it's fragmented right now. Um, my view is that do we need to create one global standard for this? Um, maybe not yet, we don't need to force it. Uh, I think we just need to be better at creating and embedding frameworks that are fit for purpose and relevant. So I think we need to use uh, these, all these different indicators we're talking about uh, regarding trust according to our needs, whether that's for getting advertising, finding the right partners to work with, um, or as a driver for media literacy. And I think it's been a, a great uh, discussion. I've learned a lot in this conversation, so thank you. Thank you very much, Jason. Claire. Yeah, so as I said in the introduction, I, my day-to-day -day is a mixture of trying to understand the bad stuff and the good stuff. And so the thing that I'm pretty obsessed with right now is understanding that the disinformation ecosystem is really participatory and dynamic. And people in that ecosystem feel heard. They feel they have agency. 
if we look at our information ecosystem, many of us, it's still top down, linear and hierarchical. And that's why it was set up. That's the meaning of a gatekeeper. But when we have these conversations around trust, I keep thinking, what does it mean for us to really understand the importance of a participatory information ecosystem, a networked in information ecosystem? So the New York Times is on Facebook. Is it really listening to the things that its audiences are talking about and asking about? And that's the same for every news outlet. So yes, credibility indicators are critical. We have to you know, create machine uh, learning texts and protocols, all of those things. But we also fundamentally have to think about what does trust look like? An, an, outline, an outlet can't just say, oh, I need to be trusted because I'm a trusted news outlet. You know, in this information environment, when consumers have choices, they can seek out and consume information that reinforces their worldview, which we know. How can we learn from the disinformation ecosystem where people feel heard and feel they have agency? So that's a little bit off topic, but this is one of those end conclusions. And I don't think we can have the conversation about trust if we don't recognize in many ways, we're still acting as we did in 1996. What does it look like to think about trust in 2021 in a networked environment? Because unfortunately the bad actors are much better at understanding that than I think sometimes we can be when we still have a pretty passive relationship. We have this, this idea that we're the trusted gatekeepers and we have passive audiences. That is not going, it doesn't matter how many credibility indicators we have if we don't fundamentally understand that relationship that audiences want to have with their information providers. Uh, thanks. That's a great point and something I think we don't hear that much about. So uh, appreciate all of these final thoughts from the panelists about where we go from here and, and what you're all going to be thinking about. Um, I think some of the things that, that we are going to be working on with the Dynamic Coalition is how do we take some of these efforts forward and make them more accessible to members? I mean, it was great to hear from our colleague from Myanmar about wanting to know more about these initiatives. So I think that is imperative for us as a dynamic coalition um, to, to figure out how do we make this more accessible? How do we evaluate these? Um, how do we make sure that they're going to be applicable uh, in all countries, in all languages, um, how do we work for you know, the global community of media and the citizens that depend on them? Um, you know, I'm here on behalf of the Global Fund for the Global Forum for Media Development, which represents small, um, medium, global South organizations, media organizations around the world, in part because they can't always be in the room. You know, they're out doing the journalism. You don't want the journalists who are investigating the corruption and covering the live protests to have to come sit in a conference room in, you know, whatever country it's being held in because they are out doing their work. And so I think, you know, it's great to hear that so many of the people we've heard from today are focused on really listening um, to folks on the ground. And I want to invite people uh, to engage with us, come up afterwards, uh, put in the chat. We're all happy to share our information and get involved in the Dynamic Coalition. And with that, I want to thank our panelists and transition over to Dan to uh, conclude this and tell you more about how to get involved in the Dynamic Coalition in the next year ahead. Dan? Great. Thank you, Courtney. And thank you to our panelists. I think we should give a round of applause for a really excellent uh, panel. Um, that was you know, really thought provoking. And I think um, the, the, the questions were really astute too. And I think I had us all here in the room thinking about different projects that we want to work on and, and how we might engage. And that is why I think it'd be really great uh, if you haven't aren't already involved in our DC uh, sustainability, uh, please join because we have other events like this. It's quite a multi-stakeholder group. We actually have um, participants from tech platforms, but also from other uh, uh, tech companies. It's not just the platforms that are involved in this trust uh, and digital ecosystem. Um, and so we'd love to have your engagement to share some of the research that you're doing to engage with other stakeholders. Um, and so that's just a plug for our group and uh, for continuing this conversation. I think, you know, one of the, the takeaways for me today is that it's, it's a lot of bit is about visibility. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about some of these trust initiatives so that, that uh, organizations can be visible. And that the other takeaway for me and thinking about this is that, you know, we, we aren't, this isn't uh, urgent just for the news industry and figuring out how to make news information's, news information ecosystems financially viable. It's really um, about 
our societies and, and what kind of societies we want to live in. You know, Courtney mentioned the importance of democratic accountability. This is a problem that really needs a solution for all other types of uh, development efforts that, that we want to undertake. So um, I think that's just uh, calling to the urgency of the moment, the power of this type of engagement to envision what uh, this, the situation will look like in, in, in two years, 10 years. Uh, we definitely have had a lot of learning in terms of engagement with platforms, and um, I think that some of these solutions, we're really interested in how we can start to scale them and make them more in inclusive and so that people understand them and un understand how to plug into them. So let's continue this really uh, fruitful conversation. I want to thank all of the participants online on Zoom, as well as all of you who were able to join us uh, today from Poland, and I hope that everyone has a great rest of your IGF. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.